Hi, I'm Larry Higgins with Skip Genie, and I'm here back at the Propelio Academy, and today we're talking about skip tracing, but more specifically about prioritization with skip tracing. Okay, in this section we'll be talking about prioritization, and some of the points, some of the different topics we'll cover are, you know, first and foremost, why should you prioritize? Uh, how to prioritize? Prioritizing specifically vacant properties? prioritizing return mail, and how to even prioritize just a full campaign list, like basically a list you would normally mail, things like that. Prioritization, I, this is one of the things I'm, I'm very, very keen on and I'm always talking to people about. Basically, I think a lot of us have heard that saying, if everything's priority, nothing is. Well, that couldn't be more true with skip tracing especially. Whether you're a brand new investor out there driving for dollars or maybe you're a more experienced investor, that's even got a full-blown call center doing your calls for you. You know, there's always a place and a need for prioritization, and it's something I'm always looking at internally in our operations, and it's something that everybody else out there should be doing as well. Especially for newer people that are, this is a very, very critical skill and, and thing that, that you need to do if you've got limited time, limited funds, or limited time and funds. You know, we each have a finite amount of time we're able to do research, do phone calls and things like that. Skip, prioritizing all of your skip tracing efforts is going to allow you to get more bang for your buck faster. So priority indicators, what are some of the things and, and different points that you're looking for to help you to prioritize your efforts? Uh, we talked about death in some of the previous sections. So first, you know, an obvious one is estates. What does an estate tell you? And if a property is in an estate, the owners died. Uh, deceased owners, what I call invisible estates. So these are properties that they're not showing up on anybody else's radar. The, let's say John Smith owns a property off Main Street and for whatever reason it gets your attention, you skip trace the, you know, per the appraisal district, John Smith is alive and living well at the property off Main Street. You skip trace it and you see that John Smith died, you know, four years ago. Well, in effect, this is a probate situation, but the property is not on a probate list. The county doesn't even show it as, as an estate, but it is an estate scenario, a probate scenario. The owner has died. The key thing for you to know is nobody else knows that unless they've skip traced them with a, a quality data provider. Nobody else knows this owner's died. Nobody else knows that they should be contacting the heirs or the family to that deceased owner. So that's, key, that's a very key piece of information. Uh, delinquent taxes, that's a, probably one of the more common types of indicators out there, especially in a, a, you know, a state like Texas where property taxes are, are such a big deal. Uh, divorce is another one. Obviously, that, that can lead to distress and uh, financial complications or distress as well with the, the, the husband and wife getting going through the divorce. Uh, expired and termina terminated listings is another one. You've got delinquent lo mortgages, loan modifications, things like that. That always triggers or signifies financial distress. Uh, property condition can be a priority indicator. So I, I make it no secret I love vacant properties, but not all vacant houses are the same they're not all equal. You know, is the, is the property well maintained or is it boarded up with a blue tarp over the roof and you don't even know if it can be saved? It's obviously run down and abandoned. You know, so little things like that, it's kind of subjective, but that's an indicator. Uh, other things to take into account, the owner's mailing address, we covered this in the previous section. So is the, is the owner, is, are they out of state? Are they 100 miles away or do they live five minutes away or even next door. Sometimes you'll find vacant houses where the owner's next door. The further away they are, the, the more priority. Uh, vacancy, vacancy is a big priority. Uh, that's, in my opinion, vacancy is the number one overall indicator of the likelihood of a deal. So I would definitely add that to the mix while I'm prioritizing. Uh, the fi personal financial distress indicators, what I call bankruptcies, liens, and judgments. The more of those you see, you know, the higher the priority. Uh, age, uh, we talked about this earlier about, you know, the, the elderly. Uh, a lot of times maybe they have died or maybe, they, maybe they're living with family or things like that. 
that can play a role and definitely something to consider in this prioritization process. So those are the individual different indicators to look for. So in an overall process, you're looking for, you're going to do your prioritization with the properties that have the most number of those indicators. So as an example, you may be looking at estates on one list or delinquent property taxes on another list or expired listings on another list. But what if you could create a list that had all three of the, that criteria? Now that's a really good list. That's a, there's a lot going on there. So I call it checking the boxes, but the more boxes you can check on a property, the higher the priority is. And we'll, we'll get into this and, and I'll show you some examples of what that might look like. Okay, prioritizing vacant houses. Let's say you're driving for dollars. And, and I use this as, a, as an example because so many people that jump into real estate, this was something they did at some point or maybe you're still doing. It's a great way to find uh, great quality leads. So we'll go ahead and get started with this. So on the screen you see, these are all just sample, sample addresses and we've got 10 properties. Let's say I was out driving in Houston and I found these 10 properties. So you see owner name, owner mailing address, the property address, the zip code, and the tax value. So without spending a dollar doing anything with skip tracing, just using the appraisal district, this was the information that I got. And really at this point, there's really no way to prioritize unless you're looking for a certain value range on a property or a certain zip code. Some people prefer, are only looking in certain zip codes. So we've got this populated as far as ownership information and property information. Really no way to really prioritize it at this point. But we'll move on to this next slide. Let's say I've gone to the appraisal district. Now I go to the tax assessor, those same 10 properties. Now I've added delinquent tax information. So if I look at owner four, I see he owes $13,400 in delinquent taxes he hasn't paid in nine years. Owner six owes $8,900, has a tax judgment, hasn't paid in five years. Owner seven has a delinquency, hasn't paid in a year, he owes $1,400. Owner 10 owes $7,800, has a tax suit for two years. And if you look at the column next to the tax delinquency, it just says L, that's a legal status in Texas. The way our taxes work is you start with a delinquency, it moves on to a tax suit, then if they win the suit, the county wins the tax suit, it goes to a judgment. So for this exercise, I've used D for delinquent, S for suit, and J for judgment. So what, what we've done just by using free public information, uh, the appraisal district and the tax assessor, I found my top four priorities out of 10 because I know these properties have delinquent taxes. And even within those four, a tax judgment is the last step before a tax auction. So that's my number one priority of the top four. So I, th I think this kind of highlights how prioritization can really be effective in helping you uh, focus your efforts. So we'll take this another step further besides just taxes. Oh, I go to Zillow, I look at each property. Now I found out that owner six on Hill Street had that property listed for sale in 2013 for $41,000. So that's key information. What does that tell me? That tells me that the owner wanted to sell and for how much? I don't know if that's the right price, but if the appraisal district shows it at 78,000, the expired listing is for 41,000 in 2013, their tax problem has only gotten worse. I'm, I'm going to zero in on that property. That has now become my top priority because I know they wanted to sell at one point. So let's say that's the public information. Now let's go ahead and skip trace all 10 and we're going to see if, there's, if we need to shuffle the priorities around. So now I skip trace all 10 of these and I get new information. Owner one, I find out from the skip trace report died seven months ago. There's still no probate and the son and only heir lives in California. And then going back to owner six, oh, the owner died five years ago. There's no probate. Maybe that's why the house didn't sell in 2013 when they had it listed for $41,000. So now I've got, 
I, I get to reshuffle a little bit. I like that. I like the fact that the owner we're dealing with the deceased owner with no probate on the owner one, and I think the, there's a reasonable assumption that the only reason there's no delinquent taxes is they just you know the owner hadn't even been hasn't even died a year ago. So you see, throughout this process, we started with ten properties. They were all equal at face value. Narrowed it down to four, just looking at delinquent taxes. Narrowed it down to the top one out of that and then skip trace and got some more information to reaffirm what we were looking at. And this is a small sample set. This is only 10 properties. 10 properties can be done. You, you know, we're really, th this is just as an example, but say you had 100 properties. This is where it really comes in handy to prioritize your efforts and make it more, man break this down into manageable chunks. Okay, return mail. That's something that the vast majority of investors have. The biggest issue is whether or not investors do anything with it. But let's say you have a lot of return mail, you're ready to do something. Maybe you're a high volume mailer. You know, I've dealt with people that, you know, they do 15, 20,000 pieces of mail a month. They regularly get over a thousand pieces of return mail a month. That's a lot to handle. That's a lot of, a lot of energy and effort to try and prioritize or try and skip trace all that mail. So one way to do it through prioritization. So how would you prioritize your, your return mail? Uh, first and foremost, the post office will do you a huge favor sometimes on your return mail. Either handwritten, stamped, or sometimes on that yellow label that they'll put on your return mail, you'll see vacant. Again, vacant, they may abbreviate it, abbreviate it F-V-A-C. Uh, that's going to tell you, obviously, the house is vacant. Or they may put, again, handwrite it, stamp it, or it may be on the label, deceased. So if you get a thousand pieces of return mail, right off the bat, I would be looking for which ones are vacant or deceased. Or maybe I've seen it some, sometimes they'll actually have both of that, vacant and deceased stamped or written on the mail. So real quickly, very, uh, in a very quick time frame, you've taken a thousand pieces of return mail and probably got it down to 100 pieces or less that are confirmed vacant or deceased by the post office. That's a huge time saver for you. Now you, you were able to take your top priorities and focus on them first and foremost above all your other leads. Uh, if it's a good list, I would still skip trace the rest of the mail, but I would specifically be looking for new deceased owners. You know, you know the Maybe the post office didn't know that owner had died to tell you they were deceased. Uh, the other thing is look at the age and then look at the address history. You know, you, you got the return mail. Is, the, is there a more current address based off of the skip trace report that the owner is now out of state or living across the state or something to that effect? And as always, financial distress indicators. Uh, those always take a look at those. Do they are they dealing with a lot of financial distress, bankruptcies, liens, or judgments? Prioritizing campaign list uh, and a campaign list is let's just say it's a list that you would normally mail. Uh, it is doable and you can you can skip trace it and prioritize it and just start calling it. So rather than mail, you're just going to pick up the phone and call them. So what would you look for to try and prioritize? Say your mail campaign was a thousand people. It's really, it's similar to return mail that we just talked about. You're just going to skip trace the entire list of a thousand and you're going to, we're going to get back to some common themes here. The first thing you're going to look for is, are there any deceased owners? Again, that's always going to be top priority looking for those deceased owners because there's not, there's just very little to no competition and they tend to be very distressed leads. Uh, when you get your skip trace reports back, pay attention to the age as well. Again, uh, you know, are they, how old are they? Are they in a home? Have they maybe died? There's no record of it. Or, or do you need to be contacting the relatives? Uh, again, the other stuff, you're seeing common themes here. Are they out of state? Do they live far away? Financial distress and things like that. So the main thing is just skip trace it and pay attention to the data that you get back. And, you know, focus in on the ones that have a lot of issues, either the deceased owner and age, first and foremost, and then look at location and financial distress and things like that. Um, one other thing to take into account, and this is really kind of getting into the weeds, but you know, vacants. Even with a mail list, it's hard to confirm. It is very, um, takes a lot of work to do this, 
But if you really want to try and focus on vacants from just a raw list that you get, you could just go to Google Street View line by line and look and see what does that property look like. In some areas where Google Street View is not updated, it's, it's harder to do because the pictures can be four, five, six, seven years old. But if it's a truly distressed property and you're in an area like Dallas or Houston where the picture's a, a year old in a lot of parts of town, if it was boarded up last year or, or it was obviously run down and abandoned a year ago, there's a high likelihood that it still is. So you don't have to do that step. And it's definitely, there's a lot of effort there, but it, is it something you could train a VA to do? Yes. Is it, you know, it's just, it's really just a matter of how far do you want to take this and just something to kind of throw in the mix for consideration. Again, my name is Larry Higgins. If you have any questions or comments about the material we covered, feel free to shoot me an email at larry at skipgenie.com or submit your questions or comments in the section below. If not, we'll see you in the next section.